Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, I want to take and share with you some very interesting insights that I have uh, gleaned in regards to the book that John speaks about here in Revelation chapter 5. The, the book that's sealed with seven seals, that no man was able to take the book nor to loose the seals thereof. And of course, we know John weeps bitterly over this. Uh, it's what we find in Revelation chapter 5. And uh, we're going to look at this. And then as I, I share with you, there is a, a, a book that I'm going to cite from the Nag Hammadi collection. It is, they title it The Gospel of Truth. Uh, and I, I only like to, I'm only wanting to use this as a reference source, not as a biblical context by no means. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, a little bit about this book here. So the text was written in a strong poetic skill, notable even in translation. It includes heavily uh, cyclical presentation of themes. It is not a gospel in the sense of an account of the works of Jesus of Nazareth, but it is better understood as a homily. The text is generally considered by scholars one of the best written texts in the whole Nag Hammadi collection, Consider its worth highly as both a great literary work and a Gnostic exegesis. On several gospel, canonical and otherwise, the idea expressed deviated from the views of the Valentinian Gnosticism. So it does not; it is not a Valentinian uh, work, <clears throat> although there are some scholars that have claimed that it was. It's, it is clearly not according to the style that it's written in. They go on to write in here, the writing is thought to cite or allude to the New Testament Gospels, Matthew and John, as well as one, uh, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Hebrews, First John, the book of Revelation, and uh, cites John's Gospel the most often, is often influenced by the Gospel of Thomas, which as I mentioned to you before, the Gospel of Thomas, it was not just found in the Nag Hammadi Library, but the Gospel of Thomas. There has been five uh, books that have been found of this particular gospel uh, all over Egypt. And, of course, it is believed by many scholars that it should have been included as part of the canon. Now, this one that they call the Gospel of Truth, that's not been, that's, that's not been the case in that book. But again, as I said, <clears throat> normally for me, it's to look at what the thoughts were of the writers in that time period. It is believed to be written about 100 years after the time of Christ. So it still has a merit for historic value. And I think that's the reason why I like to consider that. Let's, before we read it, though, let's go over here. I want to go back to Revelation. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book, to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Hmm. I wonder what it means by under the earth, right? That's an interesting one to consider. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open or to read the book neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, I'm going to take you now to this particular writing. And I'm wanting to share uh, two of the pages with you. And in light of this, all right, so let's take a look at these two documents, as I mentioned to you before here. He is the one who set the all in order, and in whom they all existed, and whom all lacked, as of whom some have no knowledge. He desires that they know him, that they love him. For what is it that they all lacked, if not the knowledge of the Father? He became a guide and quiet and leisure. In the middle of a school, he came and spoke the word as a teacher. Those who were wise in their own estimation came to put him to test, no doubt the Pharisees. But he discredited them as empty-headed people. 
They hated him because they really were not wise men. After all these came also the little children, those who possessed the knowledge of the Father. When they became strong, they were taught the aspect of the Father's face. They came to know, and they were known. They were glorified, and they gave glory in their heart. The living book of the living was manifest. Did you catch that? In their heart, the living book of the living was manifest. The book which was written in the thought and in the mind of the Father and from the foundation of the all is that incom incomprehensible part of him. This is why I kind of like aspects from these writings. They may not be canonized, but there's little nuggets that you can glean from these books, these writings, as I said, that evidently are historical. This is the book which no one found possible to take since it was reserved for him who will take it and be slain. No one was able to be manifest from those who believed in salvation as long as that book had not appeared. For this reason, the compassionate, faithful Jesus was patient in his sufferings until he took that book since he knew that his death meant life for many. Just as in the case of all will which has not yet been opened, the fortune of the deceased master of the house is hidden, so also the case of the all which had been hidden as long as the father of the all was invisible and unique in himself in whom every space has its source. For this reason Jesus appeared. He took that book as his own. He was nailed to a cross. He affixed the edict of the father to the cross. Now, no doubt we are reading from this gospel of truth that we're reading that this is the book of Revelation that we read about. But what I find fascinating is let's follow this passage right here in green. After all these came also the little children. You remember when Jesus said to his apostles when he brought the little child in the midst of them, he said, except you be converted as this little child, you will in no wise see the kingdom. After all these came also the little children who possessed the knowledge of the Father. They already have it. When they became strong, they were taught the aspects of the Father's face. By the way, there's many places written in these documents that the knowledge is in them. It's just they are in a body of forgetfulness. The body that we are in traps our soul from remembering where we came from. They came to know, and they were known. Hmm. They were glorified, and they gave glory. In their heart, the living book of the living was manifest. The book which was written in the thought and in the mind of the Father, and from before the foundation of the all, it is that incompre incomprehensible part of him. There's another place in here where it goes on to say they're the ones that they become. Maybe I'll, let me find that for you. That's another very interesting aspect, and I don't think I have it here. Let me just see. <clears throat> I'm just going to read the highlighted part here, starting with the blue. For he revealed it in a view of knowledge in which all its emanations concur. This is the knowledge of the living book which he revealed to the eons at the end of his letters revealing how they are not vowels nor are they consonants so that one might read them and think of something foolish but rather that they are letters of truth, of the truth, which they alone speak who know them. Each letter is a complete thought. 
like a complete book. Since they are letters written by the unity, the Father having written them for the eons in order that by means of his letters they should know the Father. Why his wisdom contemplates the word and his teaching utters it, his knowledge has revealed it, while forbearance is crowned upon it and his gladness is harmony with it, his glory has and I forget exactly where we go next with that. But the thing is, this, by the way, this is where he's talking about, too. He's still talking about, um, let me see if that's it, though, there. His glory has, nope, that's not there. But anyway, this is actually still the same premise of what I was reading to you earlier, just at a different, uh, different. I think it's a different book, but the same verbiage in the book here. Uh, there came the little children also to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs. Having been strengthened, they learned about impressions of the Father. They knew they were known, were glorified. They glorified there was manifest in their heart the living book of the living. The one written in the thought and in the mind of the Father, which from before the foundation of the totality was within the incomprehensibility. That book which no one was able to take. Since it remains for the one who will take it to be slain, no one could have become manifest from among those who have believed in salvation unless that book had appeared. For this reason, the merciful one, the faithful one, Jesus, was patient in accepting the suffering into the book until he took that book, since he knows his death is life for many. Just as there lies hidden in a will before it is opened, the fortune of the deceased, right? We read, we were reading all this earlier. He put on that book. He was nailed to the tree. He published Edict of the Father, Father on the Cross. Oh, such great teaching. He draws himself down to death through life eternal close, clothes himself, having stripped himself of the perishable rags. He put on the imperishability, which no one can possibly take away from him, having entered the empty spaces of terrors he passed through those who stripped naked by oblivion, being knowledgeable and perfection, proclaiming the things that are in the heart, teach those who will receive teaching. But those who are to receive teaching are the living, who are inscribed in the book of the living. It is about themselves that they receive instruction, receiving it from the Father, turning again to Him, since the perfection of the totality is in the Father. It is necessary for the totalitary to ascend to Him. Then if one has knowledge, he receives what are his own and draws them to himself. For he who is ignorant is in need, and what he lacks is great, since he lacks which will make him perfect. Since perfection of the totality is in the Father, it is necessary for the totality to ascend to him. And for each one to receive what are his own, enrolled them in, adv in advance, having prepared them to give those who came forth from him. All right, basically, let me sum this up a little bit in layman's terms right here. That book that no man could take, that John writes about here in the book of Revelation there, and that book that is unsealed, it is, it is, Literally, we are, what does the scripture say? We are written epistles read of all men. Isn't that what the scripture says on there? Where is that actually written at? I was trying to remember that. Let's see. Maybe it's 2 Corinthians. Where's my, yeah, here we go right here. You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men, right? Let's, let's back up. This is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some other epistles of the common commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as you are manifestly declared by the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, Notice that, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. You see, the book that, that Jesus was the only one that he, could, that he could open and break those seals to that book, that book was the apostles themselves. These little children, remember there was another place I showed you where the little ones 
Remember what it says after they were going to, he said, smite the sheep, scatter, the, you know, the shepherd to be smitten and the flock will be scattered, but he'll turn his hand upon the little ones. You see, Christ was the only one that had the ability because he was eternal life. He was the only one that could come and lay the body down. The he could lay the flesh down and take it back up again because he had that eternal life living in him. But he also said to us that in that day you will know that I am in the Father. The Father is in me. I am in you and you are in me. Remember that? And now we're reading in this, this incredible document called the Gospel of Truth that scholars are even saying it's actually an interesting writing. They, they actually give some credit, uh, cr uh, credibility to this document. And we're finding out that these little ones, that we are also, that we are the What's hidden inside the book, in other words, that John wanted to open when the seals were broken to this book, it's not just what you see in Revelation, the seven seals. It's the writings of Paul. It's the writings of Peter. It's the writings of, of James. It's the writing of, of all the apostles, all the books that they ever wrote. It is, that's what was hidden in that book. That's why you read right here, Paul says, you are, you are epistles, which are writings written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. That's what you're reading over here. That's what he's writing in here. That's what these, these incredible message right here says. After all, these came also little children, those who possessed the knowledge of the Father. They had the knowledge in them. They just didn't know it. Christ had to come and waken it up inside of you. He had to come and take the book. It wasn't a book that you see with your physical eyes. Christ himself was the book. The apostles were the book. And maybe that Christ is revealing himself to you and you are that book. When they became strong, they were taught the aspects of the Father's face. When I read to you, uh, actually, right, when I read to you this part here, See, there came little children also, those to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs. See, the knowledge of the Father, they, they already had it, is inside of them. Having been strengthened, they were strengthened by who? Christ. They learned about the impressions of the Father. They knew they were known. They were glorified. They glorified. There was manifest in their heart the living book of the living. The one written and thought in the mind of the Father, which from the foundation of the totality was within the comprehensibility, that book which no one was able to take. Oh my gosh, I am so excited about this, right? What did Luke say here? Behold, I give to you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding this, you rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They were already written in that book. Right? Let me just drop that one here so I don't get it confused in there. We're going to go to Galatians in a little bit. Let me drop back over here to John. Oh, this is a good one. Jesus, see the Galatians. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it will suffice us. It will satisfy us. In other words, Jesus said to him, How have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest you then? Show us the Father. Believe, that, believe you not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the work. 
believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. For verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live you shall live also. And that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, keep them. It is that he it is that loves me. He that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. There's the book. It's a living epistle. That's the book itself. Everybody's been trying to figure out that. You know, if you just go in there, look, let me show you something. Let me just show you something. Watch this right here, right? Let's just type it in. Revelation chapter 5, all right? I want to, I'm just going to hit images. Watch what happens. Look at all this. Everybody, as the old saying goes, everybody and their grandmother's got an opinion. Everybody does. And the funny thing is, if you look a little bit, you'll find out what the opinion really is. We don't need man's opinion today. You got the Word of God to tell you what it says. I want to take you a little deeper. I want to show you something here. Look. There is a reason for this, and I do not remember why. Let me look over here at Matthew. See what we got here. Hmm. I may not go into that part there, but let me go back to Genesis. Because, by the way, this is not meant for everybody. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get you out of your country and out from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make the, your name great and be thou a blessing. You know, we don't really pay much attention to what God said to Abraham, but he told him to get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house. God was separating Abraham from everything. Why? Because he was a child of the father. He was a living epistle. But later, they turned it into a law. He said, I will bless them that bless you, and him that curses you will I curse. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Call mishpachat, Adama. And by the way, when he says in you, Becha, it's right over there. That's Abraham alone. Didn't say Bechem, he said in you. All, call Mishpachat. Of Komishpachot, actually, Hadama, all the families of the earth. Because Abraham believed. 
His faith is what did it. But I want to show you what happens to man, though, what he did with it. Let's see. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differ in nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. I, I bring this up, by the way, because when we were looking at this, let me just remind you while we're doing this. Let's see. Master, those who strip naked by oblivion, knowledge, perfection, proclaiming things that are in the heart, those who will receive his teaching. There was a place in here where it talks about being the heir. And the Father asserted the totality to ascend to him, for each one received what are his own. And he enrolled them in advance, having prepared them to give those who came forth from him. I forget where it was at. Maybe you guys remember when I read it earlier. I don't recall now. But anyway, there's a reason why I had all this up here. But it's under tutors and governors to the time appointed of the Father. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when you know not God, you did service unto them which by nature, are no gods. But now, after that you have been known of God, rather, or known of God, how turn you again to, to the weak, beggar, beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. All right? Now, I'm trying to remember why I was going into that particular one there. I got the written epistles read of all man. Let's see. I know why I had the little ones up there, but we don't necessarily have to do it. I may have dropped something in there that I meant to have up, but I don't remember what it was now. We got into that part there. There was a reason for that, and I'll be doggone if I can remember why now. Hmm. Let me jump back over here and see if it's what i am got in here somewhere. No one could have become men. Of... Yeah, here we go right here. Just as there lies hidden in a will before it is open, the fortune of the deceased master of the house, so it is with the totality which lay hidden while the father of the totality was invisible, being something which is from him, from whom every space comes forth. For this reason, Jesus appeared. He put on that book. He was nailed to a tree. He published the edict of the Father on the cross. Oh, such great teaching. He draws himself down to death through life eternal's clothes. Him, having stripped himself of perishable rags, he put on imperishability, which no one can have stripped himself of the perishable rags. He put on imperishability, which no one can possibly take away from him, having entered the empty spaces of terrors. He passed through those who were stripped naked by oblivion, being knowledgeable in perfection, proclaiming things that are in the heart. Teach those who will receive teaching, but those who are to receive teaching are the living who are inscribed in the book of the living. It is, a, it is about themselves that they receive instruction, receiving it from the Father. You see, the whole thing is, is he came here on this earth as the son, as the heir to the kingdom. And so when we read there in Galatians, see, we find out 
that this is exactly the reason why God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. See, in order that the book might be revealed for what he had came to do. And of course, not only that, but also to take you from out from under the law. Why would we want to be in bondage any longer underneath the law there? That's why God said to Sarah when she had her son, and then of course she saw her, she saw that Hagar's son made sport, made fun of him. She told Abraham, cast out that bondswoman, for he won't be heir with my son. That's what we read right here in Genesis chapter 21. Cast out the bondwoman. And it grieved Abraham's heart to do that. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah said unto you. Hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall the seed be called to you. Because it was all speaking of the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's why she was to cast out that bondswoman there. That's why you read over here too in the parable that Jesus talks about when he talks about the vineyard. And he comes there and, they, and he's asking the Pharisees, you know, uh, you come in there. You, they found out that they were, that you know, that, um, let's see, let me see if I find the right spot on this here. They talk about how did they beat they they beat the the the, the servants they they took the beat one killed another stoned another one there but when the son came they said oh he's the heir let's get him sure enough right and he answered and said I go sir went now let's see whether or not okay let's, here we go here another pair, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard hedged it all around about digged a wine press in it built a tower. Let it out for the husband and went on to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive fruits of it. And the husband took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. You know, it sounds so much like, sounds like Paul. Sounds like Stephen. Stephen was stoned and killed. But also you had Micah. Micah thrown in a prison unjust by, by, by the king. You had um, uh, Isaiah, they cut him in two. And again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto to them likewise. But last of all, he sent to them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbands saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They said to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard to another husband which will, shall render him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, did you ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. By the way, the cornerstone no doubt represented those ones that came earlier. They were all rejected. But eventually, he became the headstone. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. Whosoever fall on that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spoke of them. Think about it. You know, friends, it's interesting. When we look at Revelation, that book that no man could open, sealed with seven seals, and for the most part, people think it's just speaking of the seven seals of Revelation. And even those become a great mystery that nobody seems to know the answer to those either. At least there's a million different opinions about it. And then we find out a little bitty writing here. Talked about that very book that no man could open. And then we find out that the little ones... Those that Paul spoke about, your written epistles read of all man. 
that they actually make up the writings of that book. So it's not just the seven seals of Revelation. There's a whole lot more. Because after all, in that day, Jesus said, you'll know that I'm in you. You're in me. I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. And I am in you and you are in me. I'm Stephen Benoon. Hope it's been a blessing for you. By the way, tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, we are going to be doing a Zoom meeting. Dr. Sellers is going to be joining us. So I hope you'll come and join us with uh, Dr. Sellers. Dr. Sellers will be talking about uh, the reason why she endorses LifeWay for her patients. Uh, uh, Dr. Sellers and her husband, they have followed our ministry for a number of years. And uh, uh, she's got several doctorate degrees, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she is very passionate, as she said, because the science is definitely supportive of what it's supposed to do. And she also said, besides that, she got really deep into the research to see and know for sure that this technology is safe for Christians to use as well. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Sellers at the beginning of this meeting, and then I'm going to help those of you that have taken this serious about wanting to make this a business, and I'm going to teach you how to create an amazing platform because the world is at your fingertips. I had one of the greatest um, men ever that does internet to, to help build uh, a platform that helped me years ago. And I'm going to share with you those insights on how you can do it as well in a short period of time and reach the world. Because truly, this product is truly amazing. And we want to see more people helped. A lot of people have been helped already. And we know that even more and more testimonies are coming. Uh, you know, I've mentioned before, too, I'd seen the changes uh, after seeing, um, even like in the, in the young part of this, right? It's like it just transforms people to make them look younger again. Shannon, good friend of ours on there, she's got her before and after pictures. It is totally amazing, right? Uh, even Mia, I saw it with Mia as well. Looked at her interview months before she came on with us. Like two different people. My own wife now, it's like her face is a glow. And I told her, I said, we need to do a before and after picture. You're starting to look like you did five, ten years ago already. So anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, we appreciate you greatly. And, and by the way, those of you that support the ministry, you know what? How about this month you take and do yourself a blessing for us. You support this ministry. Do you know you can take, if you purchase LifeWave, you'll help yourself. At the same time, you're still supporting the ministry. We'd rather see part of what you do to support this ministry to bless yourself with. Maybe somebody in your family not doing well. And you might find out X39, when it stimulates your stem cells, it might make a major difference for you. Take the time. I'll put the I'll put by the way, I'm gonna put also the Zoom meeting link here in the description as well as the uh the our website link there if you want to try the product out for yourself. God bless.